Hello, everybody. Hi. Uh, welcome back. So the first thing to say is to sorry to, uh, sorry to break into your table discussions. Uh, you probably saw on the tables you're on that I just dropped in and listened for a few uh, for a minute or so and then moved on to the next table. So I hope that wasn't too impolite, but I really wanted to kind of see what sort of things were being talked about. And there were some great conversations going on. So I hope you've enjoyed that. And there will be some more of that after this panel. Um, so we ho I hope you've made some good contacts. Do use the chat um, and other features along, along the bottom menu when you're talking to people to send them messages, connect with each other, send them your LinkedIn uh, profile. And if you're attending several days of this week's conference, uh, in the top right-hand corner, there's a little circle. Uh, you can click on that, upload a photograph, put in your organization name, put in your LinkedIn and other connections, and even connect your calendar. Uh, so that you can fix up meetings with people. Um, anyway, now we have a panel discussion, uh, the topic of which is how to innovate in an unsteady state. So I'm going to invite up my four panelists and we uh, will get that panel underway. So uh, if I can have my four panelists, that'd be great. Hello, Vimla. Hey. Um, who else we've got? Hello. Hello, Simon. Hello. Hi, Tim. Hi. Uh and last but not least, Adam. Welcome, Adam. Hello. So to start with, I'm going to uh, ask each of you to give a, some introductory remarks on our topic and a bit about what you've been doing in the innovation space. And then we'll get into a conversation. Uh, if the audience, feel free to use the Q&A um, at the side uh, to raise questions and we'll bring those to the panel. And do upvote them as you were doing before, if you particularly like a question do vote for it and we'll take the ones at the top as much as we possibly can. So to start us off, we're gonna hear from Simon King, head of user-centered design at DWP. Simon has a track record as an insight-led digital innovator, specializing in making new thinking work within large complex organizations. His career began at the BBC, working on bringing much loved brands such as Top Gear into the digital space. And he's recently begun work as Deputy Digital Director, Head of User Center Design at DWP, where he manages the work of the DWP Innovation Lab. Simon, far away. Morning. Uh, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, really looking forward to this virtual conference and I can certainly report the commute was uh, much better than my previous experiences. So thank you very much. Um, as Robin said, I started at the uh, DWP as Deputy Digital Director, actually the start of the year. So. Uh, very interesting times to uh, join any organization, really. And there, one of my roles is running our innovation lab, which until recently was called Dojo. Uh, I think um, thinking about our theme today, innovating in a in steady time, uh, state, uh, innovation is probably more important now than it's been at any time. And certainly key from our perspective to emerging from this crisis stronger. And at DWP, accelerating digital change and doing things differently are really critical to being able to respond at pace and support citizens who are uh, facing really unprecedented challenges in their lives. Our, our innovation lab is tasked with seeking out uh, uh, rapid cross-cutting innovation that can impact upon these, same, these pain points. And we do this through using design thinking and agile methodologies with a dedicated multidisciplinary team. And we work alongside uh, DWP colleagues, but crucially look outwards, uh, working with external technology companies, academia, and, and of course other academic uh, and government departments. Um, I was asked, asked to pick out a couple of recent projects and work that over the past few months. Um, so with no particular focus, uh, some examples. We've, uh, for example, been working closely with work coaches at DWP to develop new dynamic tools to help them provide more tailored advice when they're speaking to vulnerable people who often have complex needs. In another example, you're probably aware that, uh, that the DWP has recently faced a huge increase in call volumes due to, due to the amount of increased claims. Uh, the team rapidly devised proofs of concept, looking at natural language processing integrated in that process uh, to find quicker resolutions and avoid uh, long call uh, time waits. Uh, looking forward, our focus now is really turning to where we can use technology to sit, assist in people's journey back to employment. Um, 
there, um, there are, of course, challenges in innovating in, in the current climate. Uh, but I think, in honesty, I find these more uh, as much cultural as technological. Uh, and I think what I found critical and something which I'm keen on is avoiding what I describe as uh, an inv innovation debt within the organization, i.e. putting things off today, which are perhaps too difficult. So we found it important to uh, make space to innovate, uh, do the things which are uh, important, perhaps, but not uh, but not urgent. Uh, and conversely, we're also finding uh, that remote working patterns are finding new ways to innovate and uh, a really good way of, of bringing people across the organization together in a, in a more fluid way rather than, for example, waiting for weeks to get uh, meeting dates and travel sorted. So um, in short, I, I think the, the current situation has probably um, precipitated a change which will uh, persist throughout the organization and in many ways uh, improve the speed of innovation uh, that we're able to offer. Thanks. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Brilliant. Thanks, Simon. Uh, Vimla. Uh, Vimla Apadu, uh, lead service designer at Digital Bridge HQ, and uh, more importantly for us at Digital Leaders, our Young Digital Leaders of the Year 2018. Uh, Vimla believes in putting people at the centre of services. She likes helping people and organisations understand their purpose and value whilst having a positive impact and putting humans at the heart of their innovation. Vimla, the floor is yours. Thank you. Every time we kind of talk about the Young Digital Leaders Awards, we get further and further away from the year and I feel like I'm not getting younger anymore. It's really hard. <laughs> but thank you for giving me the stage. And I think it's really important to have this conversation now as we're in such a state of flux, not just through coronavirus, but through societal change and challenge that we're facing from, from everything. And I think there's a huge opportunity with the time that we've been given to reflect on society and to empower people to use their voice and create change that they want to see. And we're seeing that across the UK and internationally through lots of different movements at the moment. Um, so my background is um, sporadic to say the least. And at the moment I'm wearing quite a few hats. So I'm a senior service designer with Digital Bridge, which is using AI and machine learning to help people design their homes through a guide to design platform. I'm also working with an organisation called Culture Shift, who are using um, software to help students and employees report incidents of harassment and abuse um, to their to their workplace, particularly for students at universities, um, and really tackling the uh, cultural bias that we have across across those issues and uh, removing the barriers to reporting incidents that we face, um, whether in real time or have previously experienced. And um, I'm one of those Wind for Change organisations that um, we heard about in the keynote. I've set up my own business during this time, um, Honey Badger, a fearless organisation that's helping organisations to face their challenges head on and really rethink uh, business models and culture and experiences so that we can design for the future rather than having to be reactive to change as it happens. Thanks, Vimla. That's great. Great opening remarks. Uh, Tim Pitts, a managing partner with Agilisys. Tim's career has been an unusual combination of consulting uh, with big firms like IBM, PA, consulting Deloitte, uh, digital innovation, delivering major digital programs like MyTravel.com, and also as head of service at Surrey County Council uh, for three years, but all focused on delivering digital innovation. Tim, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Robin. Very, uh, very good introduction. So, uh, uh, absolutely delighted to be here. And it's, um, as colleagues have said, it's a, a great event you've got lined up this week, Robin. So, uh, and lots of great speakers. Um, so, in terms of innovation um, during COVID, it's been a very uh, interesting time, clearly. Um, and some of the in innovations have been uh, things which would happen, which wouldn't possibly happen without um, something as big as COVID. Um, so we responded to things like the uh, request for supporting um, councils with their shielding um, process through a helping hand solution we built, um, which has been very successfully rolled out across a number of authorities now. Uh, we built things like the track and trace solution for the states of Guernsey, so that's up and running and live. So those sorts of um, uh, innovations which wouldn't have a, been necessary, uh, sorry, happened had it not been for something like COVID. Um, and it's very interesting tying into what you said, Vimna, around I think this is a time for absolute 
much bigger differentiated thinking and, and moving the red lines which have all kind of stuck us in certain ways we've done stuff in the past and um, very practically we've been doing supporting our um lots of our clients with just sort of very practical things like rolling out teams teams live events to get council meetings up and running and we work with one of our partners to get um, a, a number of authorities up and running with telephony so they can all their contact centers can work from home um building robotics so solutions to help um, authorities get ahead of the curve in terms of um, the tsunami of demand you're about to get hit once um, COVID um, calms down a bit and um, there's a big backlog of work and authorities just don't have the resilience they used to have because of all the funding cuts you've had um, and just other practical things like setting up a geosite recovery those sort of backup things for cloud uh, and many other sort of um, practical areas of support um, but if you think of COVID, for us, the, the what's it's just fundamentally changed the whole landscape for everyone. It's fun every you know speaking from a local authority perspective, which is uh, my main focus. Um, local authorities have been brilliant at managing their budgets. You know, one of the few in the public sector which really has done a fab job at trying to get the budgets down to um, to the to the ever uh, decreasing levels. And COVID's just taken your feet out. Um, I do not know a single authority which hasn't got a massive uh, financial hole now. Um, and, um, you know, the, the grants you're getting back from um, central government are, will no way cover uh, the additional level of spending you've done. So, you know, again, going back to Vimna's point, unless you're willing to think totally differently, um, I think everyone's going to be in, in, in STEM a little bit. Um, and if you look at the, um, the Helping Hands solution, which we built, as I say, to help with the shielding, that's a, a really good example, even if it is quite a small example. Um, uh, health and social care have, trying to, have been trying to share data forever and been trying to find a way of looking after the, the vulnerable people in the sector forever. Um, and you look at the data which came through from the NHS to local authorities, it's just an absolute shocker in terms of the mismatch and the, and the lack of clarity you've got. And it's taken COVID to get that really beautifully clean um, set of data in place for once with a one true list of all those who actually need help. And if you think of the applications you could do with that data to do things to serve the public much better as individuals as opposed to organisations, um, I think there's a phenomenal um, opportunity um, post um, post COVID. I think we've just got to everyone's got to rethink where their red lines are and get rid of them, um, because they're just they're just not relevant anymore. Brilliant, thanks, Tim. And uh, last but no means least, Adam Billing, founder at Treehouse Innovation spent most of his career working with companies to design new products, services and strategies and to develop their own internal innovation capability. Uh, Adam, I can see you're on mute, but uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Robin, and yeah, thanks for having me and be a part of this great panel. Um, so just echoing, you know, what I'm what I'm hearing from from everybody else here. And it's really it's really encouraging is the these sort of messages of of you know, positivity and potential, because that's very much what we've been seeing as well. I mean, we've been really surprised by some of the things that, you know, once everyone was forced into these sort of new constraints of being remote and all these unexpected challenges, just what an accelerator that has been for innovation. And also, you know, being really surprised at some of the things that are, are possible uh, when, when people start working remotely. I mean, just to give you a little background, um, so I'm the founder of, of a company called Treehouse Innovation, as well as, as Sprintbase. And what Treehouse is, is we're a design innovation consultancy. So we've got, you know, folks from, you know, who've been doing, you know, innovation work and projects their whole lives coming from places like IDEO and Fujitsu. And, you know, those projects have always been face to face, you know, or, or at least some component of those face to face. Uh, and that can be, you know, design new products, new services, um, you know, one week we might be designing the smart home of the future. The next week we're, we're, we're redesigning clinical trials for a big pharma. Um, but at the heart of everything we do is that sort of human centered design methodology, design thinking, those, those kind of concepts with it, which I believe a lot of us here are, are familiar with. Um, and, you know, we're either doing projects or training people to do it. Uh, and, and over the years in, you know, kind of our, our pre COVID era, uh, we were already starting to hear a couple of things pretty loud and clear, which was, first of all, that, you know, you might attend a design thinking training workshop in a large organization wanting to get skilled up in this way of working. Uh, but they'd find it really tough to apply that stuff when they went back to work. 
And then the other thing that we heard a lot was, um, you know, we, we need to start doing this remotely. And this is before, it, you know, remote became mandatory. This was just when people were recognizing that they're, you know, you know, all the things we're talking, you know, you don't have to travel, you can bring in all the right people, all that stuff. So there was a push on a much smaller scale, obviously, before all of this. Um, so we built a thing called Sprint Base. And, and, and what that is, is a virtual platform that helps remote teams to do design thinking projects and workshops uh, and do them remotely, right? So it's um, not just a collaborative platform, like maybe you might be familiar with uh, Mural or Miro or, or those types of tools. It's um, it's kind of a workflow engine that guides teams step-by-step step through that kind of a process so they can tackle these things remotely. Um, and, and, you know, we were sailing along just fine, uh, working with some great companies like Capgemini and, and eBay and all kinds of others doing remote, proje remote projects. But when COVID hit, we suddenly started hearing from a, a lot greater, lot larger number of organizations who were telling us that, you know, they've got loads of unexpected challenges coming down the pike and they just, they recognized they couldn't wait to tackle these, but they just didn't have a good way to address them remotely. And the technology alone uh, wasn't really it. So for us, our, our whole um, sort of, you know, reason to be has been about how do we work with these organizations to give them these sort of kind of ready to run projects and workshops so they can just start tackling these things uh, systematically. And, and that's really where we've been spending our time. And some of the things that we've seen organizations who even just a few months ago said that they, you know, never did things online, never would, you know, anything like this would be done face to face. They're doing some really amazing stuff and we're really excited about the potential uh, not just in a time of crisis, but what it's going to mean for these organizations after things go back to whatever normal turns out to be. Brilliant. Thank you, Adam. Um, so I've, I've got a question. I see some questions building up in the Q&A, so do keep them coming and do sort of upvote them uh, if you see questions are particularly keen for the, the panel to answer. Um, I'm interested in uh, the idea of, and we've talked a little bit about the innovation in lockdown, the kind of the, the pressure to make things change, to do things that were previously inconceivable, inconceivable, you know, putting together data sets that are kind of clean and meaningful because you really need results and you need them fast. But we also heard a few hints around innovation debt, technical debt, uh, financial debt from Tim, you know, kind of in the in local government. So. I guess sort of how how sustainable is the innovation we've seen, you know, post post pandemic, are we going to find just incredible pressures either, you know, either on those innovations to keep them going or, uh, you know, is there kind of a return to a pre COVID world going to be enforced upon us by lack of funding and, and you know, the inability to implement uh, post crisis when that kind of burning platform has been put out? So um, I'll come to Simon first, but do jump in. I think I think Robin, those two things aren't actually mutually exclusive. I.e., the the point about um, continuing innovation and perhaps um, uh, financial pressures. You know, very it's very much the case. Innovation is a driver of uh, reducing cost, and also the kind of uh, processes that, um, for example, Adam was talking about, are really about de-risking the the process and making it uh, faster and cheaper. So, you know, a lot of the time, the approaches to innovation that we may sort of uh, try to take are about um, reducing the potentially huge cost of doing something within the massive infrastructures that you find within uh, governmental organizations and actually cutting through that to do them quicker. So I think there's I think um, we often find, I think, uh, this kind of false opposition about um, cost against innovation when you know really what 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 we often find ourselves saying is you know without uh, applying innovation and most importantly without applying in, uh, innovation to uh, Vimla's point that's uh, human centered at the very heart we really can't get to all those um, efficiencies that we all want to see and tim any i mean so are your local are your local authority clients going to be uh, just struggling with budgets and just the practicalities of life uh, post COVID, or do you think new things have happened, new infrastructures have been put in place, which well, I, they'll continue to use? Yeah, I think it's a it's a real mix. So some of the innovations which um, they um, were trying to do pre COVID all got kind of ground to a halt. 
um, understand because the focus absolutely had to be on dealing with the absolute crisis. But, you know, from a very simple example of things like robotics, actually to put resilience back into your organization to get ready for that sort of tsunami demand they're about to get hit with, you know, unemployment rates are going, will, will go through the roof and debt levels will go through the roof. That just means by definition, a huge, huge amount of demand on local authorities and simple things like robotics, which ideally you wouldn't have wanted to stop because that puts absolute resilience into your organization and enables you to deal with the more sort of tricky um, contact. Um, but other things like, as I say, the, the, the solutions we've talked about, and, and there'll be there's dozens of other uh, other examples, I think they'll just flourish. Um, I think they've started to break down those cultural blockers in organisations, which um, have stopped or, or, or just blocked people from thinking wider than they've ever done before. I think that's a phenomenal um, opportunity to do things differently. I think probably the other point is we can't afford to go at the pace of change we went at before. Um, we have to be willing to take a lot more risk, try a lot of different things, um, you know, ha have some fun with it, but get, you know, have some really creative, sim you know, cre creative ideas. You know, domiciliary care is a really simple example. It's, it's, a, um, um, it's a huge uh, uh, stopper for people going into residential care, which is even bigger cost to adult social care as a good example. But dom care, yeah. you can't continue delivering in the way we've done it. Um, it's just too expensive and it's done by social care, not by social care and health. So why aren't you putting in digital agents into or digital concierges, whatever you want to call them, into people's homes? They're very low cost and it means you can suddenly do all your medical appointments um, and some and some of the contact uh, and more regular contact because you can connect them to other people, not just those who have been paid to do a service um, and fundamentally shift the, um, the, the cost profile of delivering uh, that preemptive care. But t tons and tons of other examples, and I, I believe it's going to be a massive, um, massive enabler for the sector, uh, but not just the local authority sector, but across the public sector. Um, I think that's key. Fim? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I was, I was trying to have some sort of panel etiquette, but I didn't, I'm not. Yeah, we're all diving in today. Yeah, yeah. so I, I couldn't agree more. And particularly around the point of the shifting culture that we've had to see as a result of new ways of working. And um, my past experience of being a consultant in the public sector and trying to work with um, local and central governments through innovation processes and large scale transformation projects was the focus was always on the systems and the processes that needed to change rather than the culture that underpins it and drives the innovation at the beginning. And what we've seen with time now is we flipped it because we've had to look at ways of working and the culture of working from home and seeing someone as a parent a carer all of the things that we try and keep outside of our work life have been pushed into it so what i think will happen and what we really need to encourage is not just innovating the outputs and the solution but innovating the way that we're going to work through it together and and again, the gift we've really been given is time. We don't have the nine to five working day anymore. You've got your 24 hours that you're at home. And that flexibility of really understanding how you work through that to make sure you've got your whole life and work together um, and push through with that culture to innovate in new, completely new ways. That's Adam? A, yeah, and I just, I mean, honestly, Bilden, that's a really great point, Then, well made. Um, I think, you know, Robin, to the question about, you know, budgets going down and will innovations continue? I mean, I think if they had to had to take a stab at what things will be like, I think that we do foresee budgets being a bit tighter for a while, um, you know, across sectors, across industries. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think a lot of new habits have have been forming over the last, you know, couple of months. And you know, Tim, are you saying people need to kind of step back from risk and get more comfortable with experimenting and playing with ideas? I think the, that you know kind of mentality, as well as the you know the, the remote working as a whole, are things that were you know kind of pushed upon us. But we've had to build up these these new habits, which I think hopefully are going to enable us to be more comfortable with trying things quickly and and doing these things remotely, which both make things a lot cheaper to do. So hopefully, yeah, budgets come down, but also these new habits that we've picked up are gonna allow us to keep doing a lot of things more quickly and cheaply. So hopefully won't slow us down. Brilliant, I'm just gonna to go to the, 
the Q and A now, as we've got um, just under ten minutes or so. So uh, the top voted one is why is the NHS uh, doing its own thing uh, rather than using the Google and Apple sort of local collaborative uh, track and trace? Although I think we're dropping the word track, aren't we? Because we don't like it in this country. So uh, track, uh, trace and isolate or whatever. But um, I mean, it's, it's a general question out, I guess. Is that to do with legacy innovation that, um, you know, departments been set up to do stuff and they want to do stuff? Uh, will this change in the future? Any thoughts from anyone? I, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure any of us are quite qualified to answer the question properly, sure. if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, I, su I suspect the answer is quite simple, that people, would, there would have been that roar of um, Google and Apple getting all our data across the UK. I suspect it's as simple as that, but I don't know. Cool. Okay. I think that it is a tough event. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, I was to echo that. I think um, data and privacy is such a big unknown for the general population. Yeah. And myself included, and I think it's the how who do we opt in to give our data to, whether consciously or not, and the government has to make a call on that of whether we believe it's something the government should have or an organisation should have, and I think there's just so much at play that yeah, we're we're probably not the best qualified to answer it. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, uh, but on, on that point though, d data is going to be absolutely critical going forward. I mean, people have been talking about big data for ages, but uh, we're now at a point where A, there's such a such huge, larger volumes of data available to us across the sector. And if we can find the right ways of um, sharing that data, and I'm, I'm the first to be against a big brother state, we need to make sure those protections are in place. Um, but on the flip side, we as people are giving away our data left, right, and centre. You know, if you've got a Fitbit, if you've got a, if you've got a smartphone, you're giving a staggering amount of detail about your life away, and then you add Facebook and LinkedIn into the mix, and everyone knows everything about you possible. Um, um, so, the, I mean, the trick is getting to the point where we can share the data in a very safe way, and where that data is being used to look at us as a system um, um, and not as individuals. Uh, sorry, not as individual services and silos. Um, and, and by system, I mean across the public sector, um, but critically avoiding Big Brother. We need to put, make sure those protections are in place. I think that's absolutely key. I'll take Dominic's question. I'll link it to Simon, um, but, but, I'll, but I'll give it a bit of a spin. So he's saying, how do we share our innovations with DWP Digital? But linked to the previous one, to what extent does the Innovation Lab at DWP Digital see its mission as to do all the innovating that DWP wants? And to what extent is it out there in the marketplace meeting and greeting and looking for innovation that it can bring into the lab so that it's it's not you know built here it's it's very mm. inclusive of tech uh, a great question thank you uh robin thank you dominic i'm very glad somebody asked that question it certainly isn't um so there's always a you know having sort of set up innovation labs at um at corporates and worked in corporate ventures there's always this kind of uh, tension between having a sort of siloed thing that can work quickly and sort of disseminating uh, innovation throughout the organization. And really, um, it kind of is both, because what I want to see is the uh, is the advantages of both those things. And certainly setting up the innovation lab, our objective really is to, to do both those things, to have somewhere we can do things quickly using multi multidisciplinary teams, but crucially, bring people from across the organization. And to, the, to, to Dominic's point specifically, um part of our part of my absolute aim is to to open up um the the department to into working with other people i'd say that you know government structures aren't necessarily given to uh, being able to work with different types of organization particularly smaller organizations so one of the first things which we've been doing this year is, is looking at how we can do that more successfully and we're looking at things like uh, how we can run uh, startup competitions, how we can use, for example, synthetic data to uh, be able to share data uh, data at one level with people to be able to prove some concepts. So, um, so the the simple answer to Dominic's question is: uh, please contact me, and I'll get people in contact with the right people. But the longer term question is: we're really keen to get the structures in place to uh, become a more open organization because at the end of the end of the day a government department isn't where we're going to find uh, all of the innovation that we need it is where we'll find the the problems that need solving so the other side of the question for me is really being very specific in, in understanding what are the key uh, what are the key problems to be solved that are really going to have impact upon you know large numbers of citizens lives in these uncertain times 
I'm going to just take one last question. I'm going with Pam Waddle again, and Pam and I have never met, so I promise you there's no bias here at all. Uh, but I like the question, which is this thing about innovation always brings an element of risk. How do we change mindsets of risk-averse public sector and large corporates to adopt uh, new technology and work with new partners? And obviously, kind of the current burning platform is driving that change. But when COVID-19, you know, we all hope and pray leaves us, uh, and hopefully soon, you know, is, is are the old risk barriers going to bang back up? Um, what what do people think, Adam? Uh, I think it's a great question. Um, I think in, in a way it's almost what do we mean by by risk? Um, from from where we stand, what we've been seeing is a lot of the sort of urgency around the challenges that people are facing right now has required them to take more of that sort of rapid prototyping experimental approach to problem solving, which I think has been very unfamiliar to a lot of, of, of industries for a very long time. But now, like we were saying before, it's one of those kind of new habits that people are hopefully realizing that you don't necessarily need to build an entire solution or, or you know, a new product, new service or, or, or whatever it might be before we find out if it works or not. And by doing that kind of quick experimentation and rapid prototyping up front, we're actually dramatically de-risking the, you know, the, 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 the itself and hopefully getting us to a, a successful place by, by learning more quickly. So I guess yeah, the answer really is that, you know, hopefully some of these new habits will allow people to continue <clears throat> to do things, but doing it in a way where they're de-risking early as opposed to putting it toward the end as the way we've typically seen people do traditionally. Tim? Can I, can I, can I just answer that? The, I mean, I'm, I totally agree, Adam. It's um, COVID-19 has showed that you can actually do unbelievably great things in a very short amount of time. Yeah. Um, so many things which have been done, um, not just technology-wise, but so many changes which have happened over the last few weeks just wouldn't would have taken years before just to get through the approval cycle let alone um building the tech you know the the, I mean, the the helping hand solution just as an example it literally took us one weekend and we solved a problem which has been sat there forever between health and social care which would never have got the government's approval but because it was a desperate need for a certain specific circumstance it's proved it can be done and now i hope and believe that sort of thing not just because we built it but the, there's lots of other examples i hope they all are allowed to flourish and i think the evidence is there and simon i don't know if you've got any good examples from dwp i suspect you do I, um yeah i i'd say um i the thing that's because i i'm very relatively new to the organization only started at the start of the year but um i have to say i've been remarkably surprised by how uh the current situation has really opened up an appetite to trying things differently. And, um, you know, when we look through the amount of things that have happened over the past um, f few weeks and months, I don't think anybody who'd been there longer than me would have uh, believed really that uh, that such things were gonna be capable. And the, the other point I would say is that a lot of, one of the mechanisms for doing that really is just, is just and I think some of the discussion we had earlier of, of how things are done is opening up thinking from across the organization. So rather than it being sort of a cadre of leaders who are coming up with great ideas is how do we un unlock ideas and solutions from throughout the organization. And, you know, what 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 is critical in terms of the work that we do is getting people right through the organization and how we can get how we can get their ideas and their experience on the ground and really <laughs> empower them to be thinking about these things for me i think that's going to be one of the real catalysts for innovation certainly within the context of a large organization brilliant we are so nearly out of time so can i to give Vimla yeah, the final yeah, i was just gonna say can i add to that um so i think what's kind of come out of that for me is it's really the opportunity to redesign risk and bring that risk right back mm -hmm. to the human need that the solution is solving um, so from my past experience, the risk has always been seen through a financial lens and uh, finance being time driven and uh, the scale of implementation. But if we break that right down through rapid prototyping, through early deployment and small testing, which most policy and which most governments have access to through localities and different districts, is actually breaking down that risk and really understanding and learning and iterating as we grow through to a larger scale implementation. And what I really think needs to happen is that redesign. So what what is the core risk here and why do we see it as a risk factor? 
and weigh that up against the need and the human need and the solution that we're solving. So what's that real fundamental problem that we're solving here? And do those two things actually equate to old risk or new risk? Brilliant. I'm going to have to draw to a call. We have run over our half an hour by a little bit. So apologies to uh, those timekeepers in the audience. Uh, but I'm sure you uh, agree uh, that um, it's it's been a great a great discussion, so well worth spending a little extra time on. So uh, I'm going to encourage our panel to applaud themselves, <laughs> if you would, in the absence of a, a rapturous applause. Thank you too, audience. Robin. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank no, you. I thoroughly enjoyed that conversation. Thank you so much. So um, it's time to say goodbye to our panel. And while we're doing that, uh, we'd now like to go back to table working. We've got a final session. Uh, to get you working together again. So let's return to the table working sessions. Please move to another table, uh, ideally tables of six, and then carry on discussions for the next 15 minutes. Our second table working session is about new ways to innovate in a new normal after the lockdown ends. New ways to innovate in a new normal after the lockdown ends. I'm sure you have lots to say about that, having heard what the panel's just said. Uh, when we'll return, uh, before we finish the conference, there'll be an opportunity to hear from you uh, up on stage using the, the hand-waving feature uh, to feedback some of the discussions and ideas you've been talking about and sharing on your table. So we're really keen. So please don't go away. Do stay. Do come on stage and share some of the, some of the conversations you've been having. So I'll get out of the way. Let's go back to the room. Do move table. Double-click on the table you fancy moving to. Uh, and we'll see you again in 15 minutes. Thank